and welcome to the Westmoreland Museum of American Arts virtual programming. I'm Mona Wiley, the Public Programs Manager for the museum. I am very excited to be your host for the evening. Thank you for joining one of the many artist talks focusing on the Diversity Billboard Art Project. Tonight, you will hear from Tina Williams Brewer and Shane Pilster, two of the artists involved in the project. The Diversity Billboard Art Project is a public art campaign that will display 10 new works of art by 10 local artists throughout Westmoreland County. The first of the billboards went up on Monday, October 5th. The artworks are installed on specific billboards along routes 22, 30, 31, 51, 56, 119, 217, and I-76, and will be on view at each location for 12 to 24 weeks. The project is generously funded by the Heinz Endowments Just Arts Program, an initiative that supports artists, organizations, and communities who harness the power of the arts to respond to social issues affecting the Pittsburgh region and beyond. The idea of billboards to spread a positive message through art was conceived by the Westmoreland Diversity Coalition's co-founder and Board of Trustees co-chair, Carlotta Page, who developed the grant proposal in partnership with the Westmoreland Museum of American Art. Each artist was commissioned to create an original artwork inspired by the theme, Make Our Differences Our Strengths. That visually conveys how diversity and inclusion can make Westmoreland County communities stronger. For more information on the project, billboard locations, and exhibition schedules, please visit MakeOurDifferencesOurStrengths.com or on Facebook at Make Our Differences Our Strengths. Before we get to the conversation, I wanted to introduce you to our moderator this evening, Shayla Coyer Schaefer, the lead artist on the Billboard Project, who will serve as our moderator and ask all of the questions that you uh, present in the chat. Thank you, Mona. Hi, Shayla. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing okay. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to head backstage and I will let you introduce Tina and Shane. Thank you, Mona. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. As uh, Mona said, my name is Sheila Cuellar Schaefer and I'm the lead artist of the Billboard Art Project. I am happy to introduce you to this wonderful artists, uh, Tina Williams Brewer and Shane Pilster. They both created works based on the uh, Westmoreland Diversity Coalition's slogan, Make Our Difference Our Strengths. Tina is well known. <laughs> Tina is a well known artist and um, she um, works her quilts um, about the African American experience. And Shane is known for his murals and his work as an educator. Welcome, Tina and Shane. Hey. Hey, there hey. you are. Hi. <laughs> okay. I'm sure everyone wants to know everything about you, your stories, um, the work that you have created for the Billboard Art Project. Let's start with that. Who wants to be first? Shane. Tina or Shane? Oh, you want me to go? Okay. <laughs> okay. It, All right. uh, um, oh, go ahead. Do you have can we talk about your um, what you created for the project? Yeah, absolutely. Do we want to can show we, it? So we can, do we want to see? We, oh, there it is. Cool. So I, um, when I saw this, um, when I saw this project, I, I absolutely wanted to send in a proposal because I've been working in um, a lot of different communities across. Uh, Western PA and in a couple other regions, and I've, um, I've I'm a transplant to Pittsburgh. I've been in the area since '04, so when I saw this, I I was um, I was I, I've also been doing a lot of stuff in various communities that focus on like social justice and and things of that nature and and diversity. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really wanted to be a part of it. And so when I sent in the proposal, my idea was to actually whatever the final design is that I, that is um, selected that I create 
and I'll actually paint it in a community in in Westmoreland County. So this is actually painted in um, New Kensington. So I, I worked with um, Mike Mal Malkinus at uh, oh Old Town Overhaul and. Uh, I painted a, a mural at, at Voodoo Brewery in New Kensington and got to know Mike really well. And I've, I have several other projects up there that are in the works. And I was really excited when he said that it was all good for, uh, for me to paint something related to this project on one of his buildings. So anyhow, I, um, when designing it, I, I came up, when I, my initial proposal, I had a bunch of different words like solidarity, um, unity, love, community. And I ended up trying to combine like unity and community because it's right in the word itself. Um, I probably could have highlighted the word unity a little bit more, but um, I, I think that the piece is just, it's very uniform and I like how it came out. Like there was a, quite a bit of discussion on colors to use and the style of lettering and everything else. But um, in the end, I'm I'm quite happy with the result, and I've I've talked to a lot of people in that neighborhood that have seen it, and people love it. So that makes I me think it happy. looks wonderful. Thanks. <laughs> I, I, the, the fact that the U is capital highlights that you are working with the two words. So right. Yeah, and I I really like the fact that it's like in a community and it does bring people together in itself, you know, and, and that was like a part of the idea behind this piece is, you know, within community is unity. So like working with your neighbors and having love and compassion towards those people and, um, you know, looking past people's differences to like do things together and, you know, make our differences our strengths. So I use the thing in the thing so and then uh but yeah so so much I, needed positive message now yeah and and uh, you know this is like one of um i've this i love this painting and this project i i was really happy how the colors and everything came out but it's also like one of several murals that i've painted in the city this year um this year has been very strange for everybody and i've been pretty grateful and fortunate that there's been several people that have reached out to do other um, large, cool projects like this, you know, and it, it really uh, warms my heart to know that people in their community care, you know, about art and want to see large projects like this, um, you know, just down their street. So I could probably, yeah. So <laughs> um, I remember you telling us about, um, that time that you saw the billboard that you didn't even realize you were gonna just pass <laughs> by the billboard. So yeah, we uh, my my friend. You were coming from. Yeah, the Outer Banks. My friend had a place out there, and I was coming back with my girlfriend and puppy, and we um, I was driving back, and I I pretty much drove like seven of the nine hours back, so I was kind of exhausted, and I was um. I was I was coming back up the turnpike and we were in like the last leg of getting, you know, back to Pittsburgh and I saw it and I was sort of like yelling and, and pointing and uh, my girlfriend thought we were going to crash. And then, you know, I was like, there it is, there it is. And it was it was kind of like a very like it was. Yeah, it was it was a, a very awesome moment just to see it in action. Um, it was really cool just because like we really started this project back in what like april uh may and then i i painted it over the summer we came you know we had lots of ideas going back and forth and revisions and such and then um and then once it was finally up that was uh man i i feel like when did i go out there in september so i was it was really cool to like or october i mean that was really cool to like see it like finally like become a, a reality and um it was yeah it was it was massive and it was at night so i was it lit up the entire highway i was so excited to see it in person and i had the yeah, chance it's exciting to think that we made it through the pandemic like we have been meeting all the time for zoom it has been emails calls zoom mm -hmm. and that's basically it so this is very exciting to have this positive message out there and um, 
I guess real quick too, like I, I've worked a lot in various neighborhoods. Like I've worked a lot in New Kensington, in um, uh, Connellsville, in Mount Pleasant, in, you know, Manesson, like going all up and down the Mon Valley with different communities, painting projects, teaching classes. I work with uh, Rivers of Steel, so, um, which is, you know, a, a historic site. They have carry furnaces over in Braddock and or Rankin and area and so I, I do classes through them all over you know Westmoreland and and it's so it was like you know it, it definitely resonates with me to have something that's not only in um like New Kensington which is in Westmoreland but also like on a billboard in that that same area right that's right thank you Shane okay you. Tina well Let's start out first by, I want to say thank you so much for the opportunity. The coalition gave all of us to uh, spur us on to trying to think about where we are in this world. And our world became so complex as we got through this project. So I'm, I feel the same way Shane does about when we started out, we had you know a mission at hand what was political somewhat, but it became more complicated as we went on. And I think the project really helped me personally because of the quarantine to really um, have purpose and to really think through and with stitching, which is, you know, I was on my porch for the entire time working on yeah. the piece, but, but the stitching is like a meditation and it kind of calms the nerves and as things uh, started to develop after June with George Floyd and with all of the other concerns and the, the uproar, it was kind of my saving grace. So I have to thank you for the opportunity because uh, the staff at the Westmoreland and you have been so supportive to, to uh, embrace us our, our artists and to give us the opportunity and to encourage us along the way. And I needed extra time too. So that was really important to me. So, um, I want to. I just want to talk a little bit about. Do you want to hear about my background, or would you? We want to talk about the quilt. Let's talk about the quilt first, and then okay. we're going to talk about the back, your background in Shane. Okay, so you know, um, my piece is. Um, kind, I call it a dance, and it's lyrical for me uh, because I wanted it to be animated and to kind of move, knowing that it was going to be a, a billboard. Um, it kind of harkened me back to what I really went to school for. I was in advertising and merchandising. And so I haven't used those skills for a really long time. So just taking the concept and trying to understand what has impact when you're going down the road at 70 miles an hour somewhat uh, and what you really see. And so with my quilts are very detailed. And so what I wanted to have two impacts. So one was to see the billboard itself, you know, in, in motion. And so that would be the arc of justice and the yoke of love. And so hopefully that would spur on some curiosity of what, what does that really mean? So um, the arc of justice is a quote that, you know, Obama used it and so did Martin Luther King, but it really mm -hmm. came from from this uh, reverend, a uh, minister, Theodore Parker, uh, 19th century abolitionist, who was the first to say it. And we will overcome because the arc of moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So that is why the movement of the piece is an arc, because it's moving towards justice. And then at the end of it, it has the circle, which is a unity circles, but there's circles that are floating throughout the entire quilt. Um, and then the yoke of love. And so, you know, what does that really, what does it really say to us about where we are now? At the time that I created it, which was in like January, you know, just thinking about love and how we need love in these times to be able to create a, um, a place of peace. You know, it's easy to say love somebody, but you really, when you think about loving someone, that means everyone. And it doesn't, you just can't distinguish, I like this, I love this person, but I don't love this one. These are, we are all children of the universe and working towards love is kind of heavy and it is the yoke. Now the colors that I used 
uh, for the background really had to do with our region because it's about, you know, there's water and landscapes and mountains. But I tried to put, I put in the blue because the blue is peaceful and it feels uh, like, um, well, there's a, there's a Southern saying, uh, which is that you paint your ceilings blue so that you that they will give you peace and love and spirituality and keep the evil away. So I thought blue that and they called it Hank Blue. They I thought that the blue was appropriate, even though it doesn't tell you, you know, it isn't grounded. So the whole image is floating. So each block is just a graphic design. And when you see the piece itself, or if you see it in in the, um, I guess there are um, in the in in the um, in the malls, there's some images that are there that you can see a lot closer what the images really mean. So each block represents a different a, a, a merging of cultures. So um, should I go through the details? Do we have uh, or details of uh, pictures of the details or? No, just uh, you just continue, on. Tina. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, I have a few notes because I had to kind of look at it really close myself. So um, for the for the first block, you have the a Pennsylvania Dutch on a tea on a tea towel. So the tea towel is kind of like, like an in English throwback, and then each one of the blocks are made up and anchored by a French knot. So I have French knots to go through the entire thing. Um, so then the um, the flowers that are on the piece also gives the, you know, the idea of, um, you know, being out in nature. The tea towel is anchored on top of a piece of cloth that is African in nature. And it has a, the background has a snail on. Now, nobody is supposed to really see all of this. So this was therapy for me to make the work. But when you see the piece, you can see the details. But this was just supposed to be a graphic design for the billboard itself. But woven into it, you see that there is a snail uh, that is there. And the snail refers to an African proverb, which talks about if you, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, the snail has no hands nor feet, yet it climbs. And it's one of the things that I use in the classroom all the time too with my students to try to encourage them that because some, some of the students will run really, really fast and others will slow down and they become discouraged. But we all get to the end and we are all successful because we never, every child is successful in the classroom one way or the other. So it speaks to uh, you know, learning disabilities and to fragile behavior. And um, so we want to always acknowledge them as well. So this is part of our community. So the next one, which is the tree of life and um, the block is the Amish design, which is plain. It's a plain design and all, the Amish always have solid fabrics in there. So you could see that pretty much. Uh, from the road. It, it doesn't take a whole lot, but the tree of life also refers to like the tree of life for, uh, you know, for our Jewish community as well. Uh, when you go to the next one, it is very, it is very full. It has, um, well, first of all, the Native American symbol of for the turtle, which is longevity and uh, for the ancient one. So that is first and foremost. And then the fabric, let's see, the fabric that's in it is um, satin and there's African drum and there is, there are, um, let's see, I can barely see it myself. There are dragonflies in it and let's see what else and cross stitch. And it's anchored on a background from uh, woven fabric, which comes from Central America. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the next block, and I don't think, I don't know if we can get a detail of that because because it's very difficult for, for you to see what I'm talking about. Let's see. No, well, the, the image went away. No, 
here we come. Mm, we don't have a well. Let's just try for it anyway. That's so, sir. Okay. Let's yeah. let's just let's try for it anyway. So the fourth block is uh, a combination as well. It has a, another tea towel with an Americana symbol on it. You know, friends are the best thing. Uh, and then it has a uh, is anchored on a mola, which is of of uh, um, an at. It's an applique process from. I love um, that you use the mola, by the way. Yes, the mola. So, you know, so, but my mola is really lovely, but there are so many more beautiful ones. I wish I had had more time to, to locate a more elaborate one, but it's beautiful mola. And then it's anchored on a background fabric of uh, woven, woven patterns of in, from India. And then the fan pattern that is kind of laying over top, it's a partial fan. My grandmother's fan, which kind of represents our aging communities. Is, and that is an Indian fabric as well. So when you get down to the circle, again, a combination of fabrics that the, the, the disc in the middle is a, a Indian mo um, motif and it has African designs because you can see the crossover of, if you really learn to look at fabrics closer, you can see the merging of the cultures and how people migrated and the imagery went from one con even one continent to the other and countries to country. And um, so I can't, I really can't see the other parts of that. But at the very top is the Sankofa bird which is standing on the unity circle. And of course the Sankofa bird is a, a Ghanaian symbol for you have to know your past in order to move forward to the future. And on that is the lace apron that I added just because I felt like, you know, um, lace has, has a, an, a, an important factor in many different cultures. And I just felt like we couldn't have, I couldn't have this whole, uh, array of fabrics without acknowledging the lace as well. Now, the anchor of this entire piece is the mud cloth, which is um, from, from Africa. So I, I included as many cultures as I could, but I really wanted to emphasize that the African culture really angers it all because of the diaspora is so vast and that it overlaps into so many other cultures and um, you can you if you investigate fabric you can begin to see how we are very unified through that fabric was uh, one of our first things that we learned to uh, or well um, let's see it's like an oral tradition and it keeps the culture and in many in many cultures it's the dress that people wear because before the written word, there were pictorial images that mostly everyone read. So that's why theater and theater, music and dance were the arts of the people. So again, going looping back all the way back around again, this is a bending figure that is, and it is kind of leaning and dancing. It is part of, you know, a movement. And so usually my pieces have some type of atmosphere in them. And uh, this one, I think it feels peaceful, but the arc of justice is the beginning and uh, we have to get to justice first and then start to, to nurture the love. How's That's that? That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I wanted to know, like when you, um, to create this piece or to create any of your pieces, do you sketch? a lot in order to get to a point or you just work with your fabrics and then you, how is that process like from the very beginning? From the very beginning for this one, that's why I said I had to go back to and pull out my old drafting ruler and sketches um, to, to, you know, to work the design. I knew what I wanted it to look like, but I had to draft each block. And then I had to research all of the all of the blocks that I wanted to include with notes and um, can you put them closer to, to them and fabrics closer watch to the screen? Can you Before. have them like closer to the screen so people okay. can see? Them. So you can yeah. see the blocks, how the blocks nice. were uh, 
organized and then I had them name. Mm -hmm. I had to name them all and then I had to weave them into I had to weave them into the design. So you see mm -hmm. that I didn't talk about the circle, which is uh, which is for royalty, it, you know, the mask, the mark of love. And so all of that had to go into this piece and I had to research all the fabric. So it was much tighter than I normally do. I'm sure, Shane, you probably sketch out your work, you know, on a regular basis. Mostly, most of the time I do uh, a very organic process where I just lay things out and let the sp fabric speak. But for this one, because it had a size <laughs> limitation and uh, in order, and I worked with uh, Martha Wasik who helped me with the uh, with the dimensions and with the lettering so that they, they would fit into the project. Yeah, I have to add that um, Tina's piece is three feet by 10. It's large. It's very large. It's beautiful. Um, can, okay, yes, you can see it right here. This was during the exhibition that there was more land. So you can see how the width of the piece. So, you know, the, I think the challenge for this piece was that um, making it to scaling it to size and then finding a place to actually work. I'm lucky that I have a really large front porch. And so yeah. it was a beautiful summer. And so it was, it was such a pleasure to be out there working all the time. And, and then I could have friends over to chit chat while we were in quarantine somewhat. And um, so I, but I, what I did was I made the background, I made each piece individually. Then I superimposed it on top of the blue and the gold fabric. And then um, it is hand and machine stitched. So um, there's a lot of hand work that's there, but it has to be anchored and so, so that it won't fall when it hangs. I was lucky that I visited you around, I think it was in August, and mm -hmm. I saw you working on that piece. It was, it's a lot of work and it looked amazing back then. You were still uh, working on the, on the text, mm -hmm. I remember. It, it was, um, it was a little bit more than what I expected, I think, because of the I don't have a quilt. I don't have a quilt machine. So it's it's a it's just a plain little singer sewing machine that I quilted this on and rolling it up underneath the uh, the foot was is was was interesting as well. So the back the quilting that's done by machine is kind of like a rocky road, which I, you know, again, Every component that's in the quilt, in in I'll have to call it a quilt rather than a billboard. Every component that's in the quilt has a significance, and so yes. you know the rocky road that's there, even though it's a blue sky, still you know it it references tough times. How oh, beautiful! Okay, um, I'm thinking that both of you have work at educators and um, and I think it's so important that artists that have this um, you think about social justice and you think about all this um, the idea about a community and um, how does that play a role when you work at, um, I know Tina works with uh, children right is yeah. is that your case too shane um how does that reflect on your on your work with um with I the work, community i work with um i guess the youngest i've i've worked with is about third grade but that's not very common it's usually like middle school and high school kids um uh primarily now with um doing a lot of stuff through rivers of steel and uh and hiccup and the libraries are primarily like middle and high school Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've taught like all kinds of different, um, programs. Like my, the, the thing is for what I do, like it never really existed before in Pittsburgh. So it's like teaching 
about like the history of graffiti and like its culture and doing lettering um, classes. And, um, you know, there was probably people that, that talked about it a little bit in some classes, but like, I'm, I'm primarily like doing only this, you know, so I'll also do regular art classes if, if uh, requested, but um, so I guess to answer your question, like I work with everybody, anybody who is interested in, you know, the history of graffiti, which is, you know, it started from the youth, like it started from kids mm -hmm. that were from 12 to 18 in New York and, you know, some say Philly started it, but well, that's that you got to come to a class and I'll tell you all about the, the debate, but it's um at the same time, like they, you know, the kids were all diverse. Like it wasn't just one culture or, or ethnicity or, you know, class. Um, I mean, it was primarily like impoverished youth of all race, you know? So that's, I feel like that's who I, I, that's who I've always worked with. That's, you know, I grew up in the, the West coast. So it's like yeah. very diverse out there. And um, so I have, I, I, I love working with everybody, to be honest. So and I try to uh, diversify as often as possible. I wanted to talk, I, I want to quote you here in something that, that you have. Um, it says, bridging the gap between the public's perception of graffiti and public art. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so there's a huge stigma behind graffiti. Uh, mm -hmm. People think that it's like, you know, it's all vandalism. Um, I feel like a lot of the public in Pittsburgh didn't haven't really had the in-depth education like people in New York and, you know, LA or San Francisco may have um, just on how intricate and beautiful graffiti art can be. Mm -hmm. So I try to bridge that gap by um, not only through classes and workshops, but also with like having places in the public that they can actually see you know, creative pieces by not just myself, but other artists in Pittsburgh. We also, um, I started another organization with a professor from Pitt and another artist in Pittsburgh to bring in artists from Mexico and Chicago of Latin descent. So we have, you know, we're showing people, um, different artists from not only our oh, country, wow. but others, and I try to bring in artists from all the as many states and cities as I can to come and paint at carry furnaces. So how often does that happen? This year we didn't really have um, too many people coming through. We did partner with Boom Concepts and had about 16 artists, uh, all African American artists that painted a mural that was about I'd say about like a hundred feet by twelve feet that was at Cary. Wow. And then um but last year you know, I had artists in from Chicago, Leon, Mexico, Minneapolis, Connecticut, uh, you know, Baltimore, New York. So it was, you know, from many. So like every year I try to have artists come in, visiting artists. And How uh, long would they stay here? Uh, it depends. So like the artists with, with Hiccup, which is a Hemispheric Conversations Urban Art Project, they come in for like a short residency, usually about a week. And then in that time, maybe it might be a little more like 10 days, but in that time we have several free workshops for kids and youth, like through places like the Carnegie libraries and mm -hmm. assemble. Um, we pretty much just have the, uh, everything is paid for through grants. So people just can show up and take the, the workshops for free. And then the artists also, we try to get a couple, if, if not at least one solid uh, public mural with all of them. And then we have them also paint at carry. And then sometimes we have another like, like a uh, more private or interior place that they uh, paint a mural at while they're here. So, um, so yeah. And then any of the, the, we also have, you know, the cool thing, like the community part about graffiti, which is one of the things that has kept me in this so long and has always fascinated me ever since, you know, I started in my teens was that the uh, ability to like go to a different city, not know anybody, but your friend knows a friend. And then you have this like giant network in this, this niche culture that, um, you know, of people that are, like, <laughs> I don't know how best to describe it. It's like, you know, people that are really um, trying to 
get their name out there, like literally and figuratively. Um, but they, um, it's, it's cool. Like once you get to this point and people know that you're not like a jerk, then you can really connect with a lot of different cities and cultures and learn about these cities, learn about, you know, the people there and get like a, essentially like a tour guide of some place, you know? And so when people come to Pittsburgh, I have, you know, not only carry, but we started a new play, a new wall in Bloomfield on trace brewing, um, where people can literally just go up during the day and paint for, you know, legally. And we also have a couple of other locations like ones in new Kensington and, um, was, we just painted a legal wall in, in McKeesport a couple weekends ago. So it's like wow. we're setting up all these locations so people can not only like the public can not only see the, you know, how much more colorful, creative and artistic graffiti art can be, but also giving people a place to create, you know, so they don't have to, you know, worry about the police every time they're trying to go paint something. And they can get Do you better. There's a difference in the idea that people had about graffiti between like then and now. Do you think that's changing somehow or the I think that it's always been a mixed bag and I think that it's probably always going to be like that. But at the same time, um it's not my goal to win over every single person, but if I can change the minds of a few people and you know, at least at least I feel like if people are more educated on, you know, the history of it, how it, you know, the culture of it, um, and then see the present, like what we're doing right now with it, then they actually have either more appreciation for it. And at least they're, you know, educated on it. So they're not just like, I hate that because, you know, my friend's garage was tagged, like, you know, that sucks. But at the same time, you know, we can't, we can't reach out to everybody that's in the world of graffiti. Cause it, like I said before, you don't have to have any race, religion, class, whatever to like be a graffiti writer. It's just anybody can pick up a spray can. And um, the, the thing too is like, you know, when like people really get upset about it is like when the media is portraying it in whatever way. So if they want, if they have, you know, a, a message that they want to, to get out, then they're going to, you know, to like write the article or have the, have it on the news however they want the um however they want it to be presented so if it's like vandalism they're going to highlight that and they're going to yeah. you know, interlink the words graffiti and vandalism and make it all sound like it's the same but it's like i don't know the people that are doing you know the hammer and sickle tags all over and like writing like random yeah. you know garbage and or like even like racist stuff or you know anything that's just like what we call civilian graffiti um I'm like more tied to a, a deeper network of people that are, you know, been wielding a spray can for decade plus, you know, so it's like a, I'm trying to like show the, I guess, artistic side of it. Whereas I can't, I have to like differentiate with people like there's artistic side and then there's also vandalism and yeah, it's still, it's kind of in the same neighborhood, but it's like, you know, it's like maybe the same state, but it's a different city, you know? So it comes from the same, you know, so I, I can't, I can't say it's completely unrelated because it all has something to do with, with, um, graffiti in general, because, you know, where did it start? It started with a bunch of people that were trying to get their voice out and try to write, you know, they, they felt, um, like the, you know, society was rejecting them and they needed to have a way to get, you know, their voice, you know, they, you see billboards every Yeah. Um, it was like the way for people to like actually feel like they had a voice and they existed. And so I, I can't okay. knock over still doing that, you know, but at the same time, I want to show the, you know, more colorful and creative side of it. And I also want to give other people chances, you know, so if like there's younger people that are coming up or like just, you know, interested in it, um, I'll take the time and like show them some things or like I actually have, uh, worksheets that I've created to show people how to like do their own lettering out of their handwriting, you know, make it look like comic book art. And, um, and, uh, um, you know, I'll just like give those things away. Like I've created them for classes and such, and we use them in our classes. But if somebody's asking, 
uh, I'm, I'm always interested in teaching somebody, you know. What a wonderful experience to work with the youth. Oh, yeah. You really yeah. kind of help shape them, too. Yeah, it was um, interesting right now, too, with, like, the Zoom classes. Like, I just did a couple of classes this morning, and um, you're, like, looking to a bunch of screens that are, like, black or with their little icon on there, you know? <laughs> like, they're not that you're not like watching them draw this and they're like muted and then you're like hey so what are you guys working on and then sometimes they'll like show them you know up to the screen but sometimes they're you know a little bit shy on what they are drawing and stuff so you kind of like have to coax them so it's like a different dynamic now you know normally i would oh, walk really. class and show them like oh you could try it this way and use this color and here you can you can bend this line this way and it'll make your your letters stand out more. But now it's like um, you know I, I was showing you guys earlier like I was doing these classes and I pretty much have my own little art board up. You know I was this was like the last of four classes. Um, right. Here I'll show you. So I mean this is like I had the kids pick out what they uh, wanted me to write and then you know like the you know and then like the colors and the kind of uh, general idea. And then so they chose everything and you were working as they were telling you, they were asking yeah, you what to do and then. It was kind of like Bob Ross style. Like I, we first came up with the word, which was Miles for Miles Morales from Spider-Man. And then I looked up on the internet, like a picture of, of um, you know, that version of Spider-Man and then wrote out the letters. And I, as I'm going through it, I'm like walking them through the whole process and talking about like why I'm doing certain things and how to do certain things. And then, um, you know, talking about color choices and like we already had a class on color theory and, and uh, lettering, um, different types of lettering, like typography, you know, sign painting and fonts. And um, so we kind of tried to combine it all into the last segment. Normally it would be like a group effort and all the kids would work together on something, but instead I'd try to do like a cool, group presentation where they at least get a uh, have input on what we're creating so and that was and i i guess i i was thinking about it real quick um how you were saying like your your process took take a, a very long time like i made this in like a you know 50 minute class like with trying to coax them to do stuff and getting them to like give ideas as well and all my markers were done and that reminds me of when you sent me the videos and the photographs of, as you were working on the mural for mm -hmm. this project. And it was so fast. Just in a few days, you had it ready. Yeah. I, I was thinking about that later. It was I, unbelievable. I was, I I was, was like, how can he work so fast? I finished the whole thing in like one solid day. Like I, I think I painted it all in like eight hours. Um, and it probably, I probably would have painted it faster, but that wall was so raw and porous that I, I actually, I sketched it out and then I primed everything uh, where all the letters were. So the paint would actually hold to the wall. And then I had to like go back and, and fill everything in. And I was, as right. I was putting things in, I it had was more of the time of you deciding, like defining the idea of how you were going to go with that, with community and yeah. uh, lettering, the type of lettering that you were going to use, the colors and everything. I, if I recall, I had um, two, and it two different designs with two letter styles that uh, everybody liked. And then like yeah. a couple of different photos of past pieces that I'd painted. And, and I was like, all right, I'm just going to combine all these. I just I kind of. And I, I love that contrast against like with the aqua color with the mm -hmm. bricks and the, it looks amazing. Yeah. I, um, colors are like my favorite thing. And so like to work with so many different colors and like try to find different color combinations that work yeah. and didn't work like, that's um, you know the 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 fast the speed of how um, a project like this or like a painting or mural can go up, and like you're you can figure things out with spray paint so quickly, is um, 
one of my, you know, it's one of my favorite things about it. So, yeah, that's fantastic. We were talking about, uh, talking about the uh, educating, talking about kids. And I wanted to ask Tina about her experience educating, uh, working with kids, because I know you've been working for so many years with kids, um, with the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts and uh, through the council, right? right? Through the Pennsylvania Council for the Arts too. Can, can we talk about that? Um, well, yeah, I'm basically, I have, I started with the Society of Contemporary Crafts first and, mm -hmm. and I did that 25 years ago. And it was the first integrated art projects where math and science and we did some, some dying. So all of that was rolled into the project. So that was my first start. So I did that for about five years and then I came on board with the uh, Center for the Arts and working with uh, Mary Brenholz with uh, the kids and uh, kids projects. And I've been with Linden School for 20 years now, almost, well, actually 18 years, uh, working with their first, second, third, fourth, and fifth grade. So it's kind of a legacy project where we introduce the students uh, in kindergarten to story quilts and how to capture the concepts and ideas. Uh, integrating them into the culture. I have like a trunk show that I that I bring along. Uh, I teach the children how to like decode so that they can tell me what they see, how they how it. Makes. So it's kind of how art makes you feel and how you can become an how you feel like an artist. So by the time they get to the fourth or fifth grade, they've got it you know down pat and they understand much of the vocabulary and. Um, so they're really ready to start to express themselves. Uh, I do everything through the lens of the African and African-American idea, but encourage the students to bring their cultures in. And it's amazing how many of the students uh, that are, are not African-American that really prefer to use the symbols. So like Shane, I use um, color. We talk about texture, we, how things make you feel you know, how you imagine the world. We bring a little bit of civic uh, uh, um, preference into some of the projects, like the one that is here on the screen is um, each child, well, first of all, everybody wants to start with themselves. So I try to incorporate this, let the students incorporate their own images into as many pieces as possible because it holds their attention. And then we layer on, you know, the, the language, which is this one was about um, what if, if uh, you be the change. So we were talking about changing the world and how you could change the world, whether or not you were going to change the world, or if you were to just talk about changing the world, how actually putting action into the words. And so, um, and they, and they learned piece work, which was a, an advanced class for them because a lot of times in the earlier ages, I use a collage. Collage is more uh, user-friendly, as they say. So, uh, and we try to always give them a really wide palette uh, for them to use color-wise and texture-wise. So, um, and so the, 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 the layering comes in after they have their composition done, then they come back in with their marks. And I have a, I, I have a book that I got way back. It's now like the oldest book and it's the raggediest book ever, but it has all of the symbols in it for uh, the African diaspora. It talks about the different cloths and it has the meaning. So I give the symbols to the students and let them choose what symbols they want to either put in as markers or if they want to use to sew them in. So they learn to do embroidery. So each each uh, project, wow. we always talk about it being a La Casa, which is a memory board. And um, I have, I had a really great- Like the card. one on the, the bottom left, corner. Can we talk about that piece this on the bottom right left corner? This one right, oh, well, I guess the bottom left corner. That is the, the one that we did with fifth grade last, uh, the fourth grade last year, which is being the change. How you can change 
how you can teach others to change the world and that we are responsible for the environment. And it doesn't start when we become an adult, that we have to think about changing right now, mm -hmm. uh, what you can do as an individual. So trying to give them a sense of responsibility, but by making a right. result and working on it, it kind of uh, solidifies that, that concept for them. So they have a memory, but these, there were four of these quilts uh, made last year and they are going to be part of the uh, legacy there at the school um, so that those children learned about what is the legacy, being able to do something that is permanent, that when you become an adult and you bring your children back to the school, there's something there that you left a footprint, leaving a footprint of your thoughts at a point in time. So that's what that one is about. It is one of the Seems students. such an important concept, Tina, because kids don't think about that. Oh, uh, but legacy is so important. And yes. I, you need to start thinking about legacy very early on, about wh where your mark is, where your footprint is going to be. Um, and as you, and you know, and especially since a lot of students, because it used to be, you know, we could talk a lot about family. Uh, and family concepts, but so there is just a fragile situation now. So we have to talk about about, about the child in its in its entirety. It's the silo of that person, and then if they want to bring in some outside interests like the neighborhood or their family, then they they can add those on. But there, this is a very wonderful uh, vehicle for students to be able to. Um, you know, express themselves. So they had, they got the pose and they got to wrap themselves in uh, kente cloth and they got to choose. I bring in my collection you know, every year to, for the students to interact with them. So even though they're museum pieces, they are in the classroom for the entire time that I'm there in the school and they can reread them and, and have this marker for themselves. Uh, and so we gave them we, they have the, the permanent piece that's there, but we also gave them one that they could take home too. So they had a, a little picture. So those are the portraits of the kids? Those, each one is a portrait. I don't think we can get in close enough, but each child chose a quilt to pose in front of and to wrap themselves in fabric. And, and did you then, make the groups or they, no. like, did you divide them in, a, in groups of nine kids and they... Or they were working like a, a as a whole classroom, and then they were put together. So um, after, well, this so they each got a portrait done. Okay, so each child yeah. had received a portrait that they posed for, and that went on muslin. So that is a photo transfer onto the muslin. Then the hard part was having them to do the piecework, which was to put the corners on the hexagon. And it, that took a long, long time for them to do that and then to be able to quilt it down. So the important part for them, of course, was the portrait. So the portrait was done first and then came the piecework. So who gets to be in the center? Each who gets to be in that... See, I can just imagine that they're all thinking, I want to be in the center. I like, what's the position of your photograph? Are you going to have it in an angle there? You know, it was surprising that it, there, that wasn't even an issue with all of the students because once the blocks were done, I had them rearrange them. We put them on the floor, you know, so they arrange it. And every, every time I do a project, with them, I let them know that it is a collaboration because once they do all the designing and do their their stitching uh, on mm -hmm. the on their block, I take I take it home and I quilt it on my machine. So it's so it's it's a collaboration between the two of us. But they they do all that the is amazing. Yeah, yeah it, it, cool. it's such an important concept just to teach people from the from the early, from early age. Uh, to collaborate, to work as a team, to, you know, to, to have a community. Yeah, right. It's exactly what we're talking about. Things that have to start early on in life. Um, I, um, if anyone has any question, uh, just let us know. We have a few minutes. We have five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Mm 
I really like that you use the word legacy too. That's like such a cool concept that like, yes. I, I don't feel like a lot of kids really even grasp at any age, you know, <laughs> until it's like really introduced to them and like, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and I think that we started, well, first of all, when you start to talk about the history of, of quilts, and uh, what is what is a quilt? And and so we talk about the basics on that, so they understand what a quilt is. But then, then that kind of gets them involved with the old high, high idea of um, that this is comfort, and this is something my grandma made, and it's you know. So it puts them in a place of of reverence for the materials because somebody loved them enough to make something for them. So now you're making something too. So you kind of, you, you do, you do the scaffolding with the storytelling and like every quilt has some story that it, it's a teaching tool. So it's all, it's all about um, looking at permanence and fiber and collage. And no matter what, no matter what their composition is, it's, it's perfect because it's about them. It started with them and it ends with them. So, um, and that, and that's the joy of it. I mean, I usually work with um, uh, elementary school students, but I started out with middle school students and I actually did a project with uh, some, some, some high school students at Westinghouse High School. And it was really amazing to see these young men who didn't want to use the sewing machine and was grumbling all along at the end of the of the time, they they were hugging their pillows, and I'm going to give this to my mom, yeah. and to my grandma, and it's like, and this is I'm not going to leave. Yes, I'm going to leave. Are you going to come back? No, but it's just you know, people, our our children are afraid of failure, and they're afraid of you know yes. what other people are going to think about what they're doing. So it's about getting gaining their confidence mm -hmm. and getting their trust there. And you know, I make mistakes and I say I make mistakes all the time but we work it through this is the creative process when you make a mistake you just have to figure out how to fix it so you know I I kind of bring it to that level which is like I'm not better than you we are equal in that we're both learning through this and if you trust me enough please trust me then you know I'll take you on this journey and yet, and it happens. Sometimes it takes a long time for it to happen. But by the time we get to the end of the project, they really do trust. And, um, you know, so the next adult that comes along, hopefully they will receive a little more trust. Yeah, I, I feel like very similar um, with like the kids, like when I'm showing them all the lettering stuff and I'm showing them stuff that I've, you know, with 20 years experience behind me and they're like doing it for the first time and they're like this looks awful and i'm like it's okay we all started there it's just you know i make a lot of mistakes too and i have you know i'll show them how to fix things and change things up and i i feel like you know it takes a couple of classes at least you know before i can really uh start to build their trust and so they understand like you know i can do this and it'll be all right if it doesn't look perfect Everybody has to start. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, well, our time is almost over. And before that, I wanted to ask Tina about the Trolley Station Oral History Center. Yes. Can well, you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it still exists uh, in paper only. I don't have a bricks and mortar at this anymore, but I do have you know, a lot of the papers and I have the concept of, of how the oral tradition enhances our lives and to ca to capture those memories. And so um, I'm just kind of trying, still trying to get my footing and to figure out how to go forward. But uh, I really feel like the oral tradition has such an important part uh, in our lives and in the lives of our children. And then, you know, to get them to understand this time and this place, you are the master of, of your dreams and to dream big and to like anchor it on something and start with, start with a dream. And so, you know, I still feel like I need to, to kind of, kind of anchor myself a little bit more to see which, what the direction is, but I'm creating a lot of work. Uh, and, uh, and I, like I said, it's kind of a healing process for me. So, Yes, it's important. It is. 
Okay, it's eight o'clock. Do we have any questions from anyone? Here's Mona again. That Hello. was wonderful. What? I really enjoyed listening to your conversation. And Shane, I also enjoyed, is this a puppy? This is Loki and he is trying to chew my hand right now. <laughs> he was barking while I was on mute. That's why I had to grab him. <laughs> Actually. Well, it's always a joy to have an extra friend in our yeah. conversation. Um, I want to thank all three of you for participating. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed the program. And I will say goodbye to you all, and then we'll close out from here. So have thank a great evening. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to take a moment and thank everybody that watched with us this evening, the museum staff and Maggie backstage making everything run so smoothly. Um, check our website at thewestmoreland.org slash events for more details and links to register for any of our upcoming virtual events. Thank you and have a great evening. <laughs>